We'll be there in a minute. As a matter of fact, you, you might want to underline this Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. I'll be there in a minute. Philippians 3, verse 1. I mentioned to you that our friend uh, Bill Khaleesi, he was 83 when he passed on. This week also, uh, a young lady that had been attending our church, she was at MD Anderson Cancer Treatment. She's in her mid-30s. And uh, she sent me a beautiful message July the 8th about how, you know, strong that God has been working in her life. And she lives in Tennessee. She said, I wish we could have found a church in Tennessee, Pastor, like the little country church, you know. And, and uh, it was just a beautiful message. And then I got the word this week, she passed away. So it's been one of those ups and downs, and I've, I've observed things. And I, I realized that in this life, uh, rain's going to fall. As a matter of fact, Scripture talks about it raining on the just and the unjust. Some people say uh, a little rain must fall. I say a little pain must fall, that, that this life has pain within it. So it's hard, and because we live in a fallen world, nothing works the way it's supposed to. You know, sin has stained every part of the physical universe. It has, sin has deeply infected the human bloodstream. You know, God gave us ideas in the Old He didn't give us ideas. He gave us laws in the Old Testament and says, don't do this. Now we've got this thing right now. The World Health Organization has put out an emergency about this monkeypox thing. You've been seeing that. And if you don't know this yet, this is on national news. It's not just from your pastor. That monkeypox has mainly affected uh, men on men. And I'll just leave that. But when ABC said it, uh, it was very, very pointed that this thing has really affected uh, the homosexual community. And this is not a slam against them. I'm just saying the Scripture lays out, don't do this. There's certain things you don't do because there's repercussions from it. We live in a fallen world, and it's, it's messed up. And trying to be kind and, and sweet and things of that nature can, can really be a, a tough thing to do. You know, things break. Our bodies wear out. We grow old and die. These earth suits are only good for a little while. And you find out people kill each other. Marriages break up. Children get hooked on drugs and alcohol or both. Babies are born with defects that cannot be corrected. Our friends disappoint us, and we disappoint our friends. And one day we wake up and find out that we're being sued by a former colleague or the boss decides that we aren't the right fit, whatever that means. And so it goes on and on. And the Apostle Paul, he often repeated the theme. I, you know, as you walk through the Bible, I saw where Jesus did the same thing as you're reading through what Matthew said, Mark and Luke, that Jesus had a, a repetition about him. And then I, I read where Mark, where Paul said in the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 1, and that's about it, friends. Be glad in God. I don't mind repeating what I have written in earlier letters, and I hope you don't mind hearing it again. Better safe than sorry, so here goes. Uh, you know, this morning, H.D. walked up to him and said, Pastor, I love you. I've heard that a hundred times from this man. Did you know what? It doesn't get old. It doesn't get old. Matter of fact, H., I looked up here, and you left me a note. I, I saw this uh, tithe envelope, and I opened it up, and it says, uh, uh, I love you, preacher. Amen. But I opened it up, and there was nothing in it, so put something in it and uh, <laughs> give it back to me later. <laughs> don't give me no. Don't give me no. Show me. Show me. Amen. But, but there's something about repeating. And, and saying it again and again. And, when, you know, I believe in my heart that serving Jesus is the best life. You can have life, but the best life comes from serving him. And lest I be misunderstood, I hasten to say that this life that we've got is the best life there is because it's the only true life. It's what he offered us. To know Jesus is to know God. To know God is to have eternal life. Uh, yeah, I, I want to repeat again what Bill Khalees said before he passed. He, he, he told Twyla, he said, uh, she asked him, are you ready? He said, I'm ready to go meet Jesus, closed his eyes and left. To me, that's dying well. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Amen. Just learning how to die well. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus said, mark, mark, mark my words. No one who sacrifices house. We're talking about that which moves God. Amen. I want to move your heart. No one who sacrifices house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, land, whatever, because of me and the message will lose out. They'll get it all back. But multiplied many times in homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land. That's why I call a lot of the elderly ladies in here my mama. Amen. Because they've been treating me like a son. It's, it's a wonderful thing. But I realize in the gospel how many brothers and sisters I've gained. And you say, well, Pastor, what about houses? Do you know I realized that as I got older, everybody in here has got a house that I'm connected to is my house? That relationship is the currency of the kingdom, and if I need a place to stay, I got a place to stay. It may be only for two and a half days, but I got a place to stay. 
Amen. Uh, you know, so we multiply that in our lives. But then Jesus said, and also in troubles, that you're going to get more troubles in this life. But uh, listen, and the bonus of eternal life. So it's the paradox. Amen. If you follow Jesus, you have to lose your life in order to save it. And, and none of this is easy to do. If you think it's easy, it's only because you haven't uh, taken the Word of God serious. You haven't stepped in. You haven't tried to get to move His heart, if you would. Romans 8, 13 commands us to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Uh, Romans 7 says there's a war going on inside of us. Amen. It's always a fight inside of here what we do. Galatians 5, 17 tells us that the flesh and the spirit are continually at war with each other. Have you ever noticed that? Hey man, you want to, you know, you want to do good, but somebody cuts you off in traffic and all of a sudden your flesh shows up. Huh? Come on. Hey man, you know it does. And you got to fight that. Uh, you, you get an email, phone call, text, and all of a sudden you, you, it gets you on a little bit on the red side. So we're always fighting against the word and the flesh and the devil. Hey man, there's always something going on. So there is no growth without struggle. We see it in nature. Amen. You don't take a chicken out of an egg. You let, the, you let the chicken struggle to get out because it needs that strength to live. You don't open up a, a, a cocoon to get the butterfly out. you got to let this struggle go. Nature tells us there has to be a struggle in order for us to get strength. Amen. There has to be. And I know we try to take the struggle away, but that's not good. The Scripture says in Acts 14, 22, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Hmm. And that's why Paul told Timothy, his spiritual son, uh, chapter 2, verse 3, share in sufferings as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Share in it. So the most beloved hymn of all time, of course, is Amazing Grace. We, we've heard the writers say, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. This grace has brought me safe this far, and grace will bring me home. So I find that there are several principles that can help us here with dealing with trials. First, because we live in a fallen world, bad things happen to all of us. I heard somebody say once, why does, uh, uh, you know, why does bad things happen to good people? And the person answered who'd been going through a lot of trials and tribulations, there's no such thing as good people. I don't know anybody good. People ask me all the time, what do you know good preacher? I say only one. The rest of us need a lot of help. Amen. I only know one good. But one, all of us need a lot of help. Amen. So because the world is falling, bad things happen. Second, we have no control over many things that happen to us or to those around us. You know, I don't care what your fortune cookie said. It ain't always true. Amen. If you if you want them astrology followers, you know, you're a Gemini or Sertigius or whatever. Amen. I don't care what it says. Amen. Don't buy into it. Can I get an amen? Amen. What the word of God say? That's that's what matters. I have no control over many things that happened to us or to those around us. It just happens. But we have we do have complete control over how we respond. How am I going to respond to this? How am I going to deal with this properly? And our response to our trials largely determines our spiritual growth or lack thereof. My message today is on a supernatural response. And this affects me, that as you walk through the Word of God, you see how Jesus handled the cross, how he handled betrayal, how he handled uh, the, the, uh, the trials he went through. He had a supernatural response, and it blows me away. Could you to tell me to love my enemies? That's easy. Amen. They're trying to take me out. They're trying to, but he says, love them. Love those that persecute you. Love those, and oh, not us. We got Facebook and, and Twitter and, and Instagram, and we can fight back. Hello. I mean, <laughs> come on. You know what I'm saying? I know. Don't look around. So it takes a mature believer to understand there's no growth without struggle. And ironically, it is the struggle that has made us stronger. So I'm going to repeat myself about a few things because as I've gone over the last few years, I realize that these things I said a long time ago need to be repeated again. Because what's happened is if we fall into a victim mentality. And we always feel like we're the victim. We've got the bad side. Be a student, not a victim. Say it with me. Be a student not a victim. I'm 61 years old, and I'm still in the school of life. I'm still learning how to be a student, amen, because it's easy to fall in. Anybody can be the victim. Anybody can act like, well, look what happened here. It, what, look what it did to me. The more I ponder these simple words, student, not a victim, the more profound they seem to me. Many people are professionally victims, always talking about how unfair life is. A victim says, why did this happen to me? Why, why, why? A student says, I don't care why it happened. I want to learn what God is trying to teach me. 
I'm in something right now. What is he showing to me? A victim looks at every, everybody, everyone else and cries out, life ain't fair. A student looks at life and says, what happened to me could have happened to anybody. Amen. I, I was in an accident. This happened. A, a disease. Whatever. It could happen to anybody. A victim feels so sorry for himself. And I'm, I'm using the word him here. I know that I'm supposed to be a, what's the word, I'm a little more politically correct here and talk about uh, hymns and, and she's. But I found out that it's mainly the men that act like victims. And all you queen bees say, mm-hmm. A victim feels so sorry for himself that he has no time for others. A student focuses on helping others so that he has no time to feel sorry for himself. Amen. If I put my focus everywhere else, I, I'm not feeling sorry for myself anymore. A victim begs God to remove the problems of life so that he might be happy. A student has learned through the problems of life that God alone is the source of all true happiness. It was Paul that said three times, take this thorn from me. Three times he said, take this issue away from me. I've got, and we don't know exactly what it was. What is it? Was it his eyesight? Did he have a physical ailment? Did he have something in his past that bothered him? But three times he prayed, and each time God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Amen. I'm telling you right now, Paul, you're going to get through this, but you're going to go through life with a limp. Amen. You're going to have some struggles in life. So understand that, that you better learn something out of this. So in the book of James, I see the supernatural response. James chapter 1, verse 2. James is that no-nonsense apostle. He's different than the other guys. Amen. You don't find a lot of grace when you read the book of James. You, you find a man that says you need to work for this thing. Amen. You need to thank God for the grace that you got on your life. Hallelujah. You need to do, show me your faith by your works. You know, and again, that's so important. I need to see something, what he's saying here. So he says here in James chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, amen, which is endurance. That perseverance finishes its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There are people that love, particularly believers, that love to go through life with their thumb in their mouth. Amen. Just like, wah, wah. You got to pull that thumb out to get a bottle in. Amen. I mean, they just kind of stuck on it. You, I, I, every now and then, I just want to go over there and put some cayenne pepper on people's thumbs. Keep it out of their mouth. Because they just fall into this thing where, where they just, everything's against them. Every pro, and it's all about, you got to realize there's a great big world out there. And there's a lot, my life has to keep in balance by saying this, whatever's going on in my life has to be for my learning so that I may help other people. So I have learned, and I'm, just, and I'm going to preach this today out of experience because I have learned how to, how, did I learn, did I learn, did I learn? Sometimes I've learned. Other times I've fought negative feelings over and over, but I have had to learn to have a supernatural response. And sometimes I look back at my response and say, where did that come from? And I realized it was hanging out with Jesus. And when you hang out with Jesus, you change the way you think, talk, and act. Can I get an amen? Amen. Consider it pure joy. Amen. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials. Amen. Are you serious? Are you serious? When you face trials, where the pure joy? No way. I, I did this, this is a cussing moment. This is an aggravation moment. Amen. This is drive my vehicle very fast moment. Amen. That's what you want to do. But he said, no, no, back up. Consider it pure joy. In other words, when you stumble into a problem, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Well, James begins by reminding us that sooner or later, probably sooner, we will all face trials of various sorts. The word face there, consider it whenever you face trials. The word face has the idea of falling or stumbling over a problem. Amen. It just happened. I mean, just imagine yourself driving down the highway, not a problem in the world. Amen. You come up to a stop sign, and all of a sudden, bam, you get rear-ended. It just came out of nowhere. You go back and look, and he's back there on his phone looking at TikTok. Now we got a problem. Amen. Because what you did just caused my, uh, my bumper to cave in. You did this thing, and now what have I got to do? I got to smile at you and count it pure What about a few months ago, my wife, of course, had been battling, going through cancer. Amen. She decided she won't drive. Well, I've been driving Miss Daisy now for eight months. 
So she decides she won't go drive. So she's going to run over to my daughter's house and pick up something. So she ran over there real fast and backed up in the driveway and hit my son-in-law's truck. About $1,800 worth of count it pure joy. <laughs> you feeling the preacher right now? You know what I'm saying? She's not here. She can't defend herself, nor should she. Came back and said, just be patient. You're costing me money. Stay home. Let me drive. But I had to suck it up because I've learned this in life, particularly with her. <laughs> I love her, but I'm telling you something. I mean, I bought a brand new 2020 Dodge Ram. Remember that, David? Parked that thing with a shiny paint job on it. She comes up to look at it, jumps her off her golf cart, forgot to take it out of gear. Bam! Right in the back end. Pure joy. <laughs> Pure joy. Oh, that's not bad. Hey, man, I just got my, my purple car painted, my 71 Challenger. This goes on and on. <laughs> Pulled it up in the driveway, excited about it. She gets in her vehicle, hits reverse instead of drive. Bam! Right in the back of that brand new paint job. Dennis, pure joy. <laughs> you have no idea. I have learned to have a supernatural response when certain things happen in my life. Pastor Joseph, I go on and on, but I think that's probably plenty right there. The word face means I, I just, it just fell into it. I stumbled into this thing with all kinds of trials. J.B. Phillips says when all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, amen, my brothers, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Amen. Exclamation point. Hello, friend. Amen. Whenever that dent goes in. Look, it's just stuff. Can I get an Amen. Amen. You, you can't just ruin life over stuff. You've got to learn how to deal with it. If you've had kids, you know what I'm talking about, too. Amen. It's a supernatural response. A natural response says we can talk about anger, despair, or complaining, or getting even, uh, or, or running away. Amen. But it isn't, that, that's natural. Amen. To, but it isn't natural to find joy in hardship. But that's the whole point. James isn't talking about a natural reaction. He's talking about something supernatural. Amen. A reaction made possible by the Holy Spirit who enables us to see and to respond from God's point of view. That counting it all joy is, is a conscious choice we make when hard times come. Truthfully, it's probably a choice we'll have to make again and again and again. Amen. It doesn't just happen just once. So what we see is not the final chapter of the story. So here's what I've learned. It is, it, this is sent from the Lord. If it's sent from the Lord, I've said it a hundred times, if it's not God sent, it can be God used. Amen, can to teach. This is also necessary for my spiritual growth. God realizes I need to grow a little bit more, so i got to deal with this. And you can't trust your feelings. Listen, so many times our feelings lead us wrong. You won't feel joyful. <laughs> oh, with some kid watching TikTok, or your wife missing forward instead of reverse. And I, well, I can talk about my own kids, too, and stuff that they've done, and you can't trust your feelings here with this moment. It's likely to be filled with a whole lot of negative emotions. So don't judge your circumstances by your feelings. Judge your circumstances by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. When you do that, a powerful conclusion emerges. These great trials give me great hope that God means a great benefit for me. Now, I will not repeat this for any other reason than to help you understand as we move through the next few weeks and months and years that there's going to be times in your life that you're going to have to learn how to count it joy. And you're going to get mad at first, and, but you're going to remember this message. It's going to come back to you, and you're going to remember, i got to count this joy. i got to look at this and realize that I, I, I just stumbled into this thing. I didn't see it coming, but here it is. That word joy is a deep satisfaction that comes from knowing that God is in control, even when my circumstances seem to be out of control. I've shared the story so many times about David when he had the little baby. And you know the story. It was with Bathsheba. It was a situation that should have never happened. But he later married Bathsheba. And that child was born and, and the baby was sick. I'm so glad that this book does not uh, sugarcoat this thing. It was a baby. It was a little, I believe it was a little boy. Amen. And there's that excitement. And this is going to be the next king. And, and David has a, has a heart for this child. And, and now the child is sick. And he did what many of you have done. He labored in prayer. He, he, he I, I believe, you know, he might have cussed God. 
And then he turned around and he got sad over it. He began to fast. He took a couple of weeks out of his life and he sat around and he threw ashes on himself and he believed God for the best here. Amen. Go to the next verse, if you would, sis. Amen. And it says in 2 Samuel 12, 22, and David answered, as long as the child was alive, I fasted and I cried. I mean, when the baby was here, I did everything I could to keep that child here. I prayed. I gave it my all. And in so doing, uh, it, it didn't change things here. And now I've got to decide how I'm going to live life. Many of you have given birth to a dream. It could have been a job. It could have been a relationship. Amen. It could have been a child. But you gave birth to a dream, and something happened, and that dream died. Amen. The passion you had for it died, and you fasted, and you prayed, and you called the preacher. Amen. And you did everything you could, and you anointed with oil. Hallelujah. And you took a prayer bandana over it, and and you believed God this was going to work out, and yet it didn't. And the Bible says that the child died. And David said, why should I fast now that he's gone? Can I bring him back? I'll go to him, but he won't come back to me. And when I read this, it hit me very hard that there are things that I cannot undo, that once it's gone, it's gone. Amen. I can't bring this child back. I can't bring this dream back. I can't bring this relationship back. I can't bring this career back. I can't, I can't do it. It's gone. So what does David do? He gets up. He anoints himself with oil. And he goes to the house of God. And he worships. See, for some of you this morning, we sang three songs. For some of you this morning, we worshiped. Amen. It shifted you. It did something inside your spirit because you needed worship. Maybe next Sunday, those of you that just sang three songs, you're going to worship because you're going to come here with a dream that's dying, and you're not going to know how to handle it. And what am I going to do next? And he began to pray, and he began to fast. Amen. And once he realized that he could not bring that child back, he be and, I, you know, you'll never find in 2 Samuel where it says David experienced joy. You know, where James has counted all joy, but David experienced a, a, a supernatural response. It is not the right. You don't respond that way. I've been in too many hospital situations. I've been in too many difficulties and tragedies. People don't respond that way. People get upset. They get mad at God. They get mad at the preacher who represents God, even if they don't know him. They, they, it, it just blows all out, all out of proportion. But, but then there are those that have this supernatural response, and they realize, you know what, God? You're still in control. You're still my Father. I love you. I know I'm going to believe you for the best. I'm going to accept the verdict. If that's the way it is, it's going to be that way. And guess what happened? Solomon shows up. Next child. Amen. And he becomes the king. Listen, sometimes you got to lay one dream down and let it go in order to pick up another one. Can you get an amen? Now, this brings me to this powerful point that extended excessive sorrow can be selfish. For you to take on the sorrow, for you to sit there and, 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 and allow it to consume your life, amen. And listen, I'm going to read this to you. There are many of us who make some disappointment, some loss, some grief, the excuse for shrinking plain duty. In other words, we quit going back to work. We quit doing anything. We stop engaging. And there's nothing more selfish than, Pastor, you said this before, I'm going to say it again and again. Because I've seen people quit living after they've gone through sorrow. They gave up life. They gave, you know, I, I'm going to just say this about your dad, Twyla's funeral. It was a, it was a, a celebration. It was living right. It was excitement. You know, it was like, hey, we know Bill, 83 years, lived his life. There's something about saying they died well. And, and I believe that for the best for everyone in this house. But in our lives, if we get to a place where it over, overcomes us, and amen, and there's nothing more absorbing unless we guard against its tendency to monopolize. And so, sorrow will monopolize you. It will try to overwhelm you. It will try to own you. Amen. Don't let it. Be sorrowful. Weep, cry. Amen. Go ahead and allow that to happen. There's nothing wrong with that, but don't live in it. Amen. You cannot bring them back. In other words, what's the answer for it? Go to work. Get back to work. Amen. Go worship and get back to work. Amen. That's, that's what God called you in to do. That's what he has for you to do. Let me start closing here. Amen. So, so I asked the practical questions. How can we go on when sorrow has paid us a visit? And what shall we do when this happens? Here it is. First, remind yourself of the promises of God. The world doesn't understand these promises. What are they? Given it shall be given. Forgiven, you'll be forgiven. Amen. These are promises. So I got to remind myself that God's got this thing. 
I, I live under the shadow of the Almighty. He's got it. Second, give thanks for what you can give thanks for. It's them little things. Every now and then, that's all I can find with my children. There's them little things. And I give God thanks for them little things until the big things show up. Amen? But I'm going to give God thanks. Hallelujah. I got to keep doing that. <laughs> Number three, refuse to give in to bitterness and despair. Bitterness is what the world does. Bitterness is what you once were. You were a bitter person, angry person, hateful person. Listen, are you a believer in God? If you're a believer in Christ now, amen, growing in him, hallelujah, that bitterness gets washed away. Everybody can fall into that, but you can't allow yourself because bitterness always affects other people around you. Amen. So don't get bitter. And next one, choose to believe in God. Oh, hold on a minute. He's unseen. He's untouched. Hmm. Maybe even unheard, and yet you believe. This is the crazy thing that people look at us and say, what, well, hang on, you believe in an invisible God? I do. That's who I do. I ain't seen him. As a matter of fact, the Bible, Jesus told Thomas, blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. Hey, I ain't seen him. I, every now and then I think I heard him. I know I felt him. Amen. I know he's around. And, and, and the Scripture, it's too hard. It's too hard to be an atheist because then you got to believe that all this showed up. Yeah. With, I ain't going to go there again. But you know how I feel about it. Amen. Surely God did this. Amen. And then make up your mind to go on with life. I got to go on. How much life is waiting for you? There could be a Solomon up ahead. A new career. Health. And by the way, what I read to you in the beginning of this about food, I actually do not believe all that. So I have to be careful what I eat, but I do have a tendency to believe that, that meat is vegetables. We have a future. Mark 10, 30, again, they'll get it all back. They'll get it all back. Whatever they give up for me, they get it all back. When I gave my life to Jesus, November the 10th, 1979, I just said, God, whatever. I just want to love you and serve you. I left my home, moved into an apartment, left there, went to college. I went to college driving a Toyota Corolla with a, uh, what do you call it, what, sunrise. Now, with the thing on top that, that put stuff in, put stuff on. That's all I had. Gave it all up. I look back on life now since the early 80s and realize that everything I gave up, God's given back. Every vehicle I gave up, God gave back. Every bike. He says, whatever you give up for my sake, I'm going to give it back to you. Many times, brothers and sisters, mothers and children and land. But also, you're going to have some trouble. But notice, you're going to get bonus in this life. And this is what David did. It's what we got to do. Grief is at times good and proper and healing. But after grief has done its work of healing and helping, then we must move on. I will go by churches and I see signs celebrating recovery. I love that. I have nothing against it. I, I, I don't have anything against Alcoholics Anonymous. But I do say this. After a while, you got to quit saying I'm an alcoholic. You got to start saying I'm delivered. After a while, you got to quit saying, well, I, I'm, I'm still recovering. You got to say I'm healed and I'm well. Amen. Let the blind say I can see. Hallelujah. Let the, the deaf say I can hear. You got to start confessing something a little bit deeper than that and move on with your life here. This is what David did. We can't go back. You can't live in yesterday. The voice of God calls us onward and toward tomorrow. Let's call it a spiritual progress to a supernatural response. So my supernatural response puts me closer to God and gives me more progress in God. You ought to be a student not a victim. Every time something happens, you're not the victim. You're learning something. Amen. And you can't, you can't get rid of this level. 
until you deal with that devil. Every level is another devil. Amen. So I can't get to the next level till I deal with the devils in this level. And God always is calling you onward. He's calling us forward. He's calling us upward into an unknown future. I can't go back. I can't stay here. I got to go forward. Heads bowed, eyes closed. What an opportunity for you this morning. If you've been away from God, whew, those watching online, thanks for tuning in and watching this. But listen to me. God's calling you even through holywild.tv. You've allowed yourself to fall into a victim mentality. You've forgotten there's a whole world out there. Some are hurting and some have victory. you got to go on. If you've been away from God, slip your hand up right now and let me pray with you. Just put it up in the building. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Just slip your hand up right now. There's three or four hands already up in here. Hold those hands up again. Would you pray with me, church? Lord Jesus, this is my day. This is my time. I'm no longer a victim. I am a student. I will press on, and I will go on. I will refuse to give in. I ask you to give me the ability to have a supernatural response when things don't go right. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in this house.